Okay, I think we'll get started, inshallah. And um, as the time goes on, people will inshallah come in as well. Um, so, salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Alhamdulillah, we have um, Imam Dawood Walid with us all the way from um, America. And um, just wanted to introduce uh, Imam Dawood quickly. Um, so, Imam Dawood is currently the uh, executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations, so um, CARE of Michigan uh, for short. Um, and it's a chapter of uh, America's largest advocacy and civil, <coughs> civil liberties organization um, for American Muslims. And um, he's also a member of the Michigan Community Council, um, the Imam's Committee. Um, Imam, <coughs> Imam Walid has lectured at over 70 institutions of high learning in North America and abroad at this uh, about Islam and social justice, including at Harvard University um, and uh, the University of the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, and uh, the University of Bamako in Mali as well. Um, inshallah, today Imam Dawood Wali will be speaking to us about the diseases of the heart that inform racism, um, and it's a very important topic in today's climate. Alhamdulillah, we get the opportunity today to find out a bit about the Islamic perspective um, on the issue as Muslims and um, living in today's Western society. So I'll pass over to um, Imam Dawood, inshallah. Just a quick reminder that um, we'll be having enough, roughly 40, 45 minutes um, of talking, and then we'll try and have five, 10 minutes of Q&A at the end, depending on how much time we have. Um, and there'll be a Menti link just underneath me um, right here. And also uh, I'll post this at the end as well, so people can ask questions from there, inshallah. Okay, I'll pass it over to you, Imam Dawood Walid. Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hamdan kathiran ta'iban mubarakan fih. Wa afdalu salati wa tammu taslimi ala siyidina wa nabiyina wa habibina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi rashidin. Wa tabi'in lahum bi khayrun wa isan ila yumiddin. Wa alina ma'ahum bi rahmatika ya ahamar rahimin wa amma ba'd. Uh, first of all, let me say it's a uh, privilege to be uh, with you, uh, brothers and sisters, right now remotely here from uh, the state of Michigan in the United States of America. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift this uh, coronavirus from us. And uh, inshallah, when it is lifted, then I will hopefully make my way back over to uh, the UK and maybe uh, see some of you all in person. Uh, with uh, Allah Azza wa Jal's permission. Uh, this topic, diseases of the heart that informs racism, I think is uh, a, a topic that needs to be discussed more by uh, many uh, other uh, shuyukh and du'at, uh, not just uh, in general. Uh, and the issues of disease of heart that inform racism should be discussed anytime, but in particular, in this current climate that we live in, uh, where we live in hyper-racial societies, and uh, there's been a renewed discussion uh, about uh, racism that's going on in the West, uh, much of it being sparked or spurred or reignited re uh, from, from a little over three months ago, of course, with the tragic uh, police uh, murder of George Floyd. And uh, with these discussions, about racism and the reactions, there's been marches and there's been rallies and there's been talk about systemic racism and changing laws in terms of reforming the police or defunding the police. There's been a lot of discussion in terms of the, uh, the politics and community organizing. Um, but in much of the discourse and relationships to these issues, is dealing with what I believe to be symptoms and not going to the actual root causes. Uh, and by root causes, I don't mean social political root causes. I mean uh, deeper issues. Our beloved Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith that uh, is narrated from a trustworthy Rijal, a trustworthy uh, narrators, uh, by Imam At-Tabarani, rahimahullah ta'ala. The hadith starts off, li kulli shay'in haqiqa. Li kulli shay'in haqiqa. 
that for everything there is a deeper truth or a deeper reality. And another hadith like this, Likuli Haq and Haqiqa. Right? So behind all physical manifestations are metaphysical realities. Be all physical manifestations there are metaphysical realities. Again, be, uh, behind all physical manifestations are metaphysical realities, right? So racism is, uh, when we look at it on an individual level, and even when it branches out societally, we're seeing physical manifestations of spiritual problems, spiritual diseases, which also relates to uh, jahil or ignorance. And from our perspective, from the Islam perspective, we don't see uh, al-aql or intellect as something that is divorced from al-qalb or from the spiritual heart. This is, uh, al-aql is something that emanates or stems from and is influenced by uh, the qalb. It's not, we don't look at the issue of intellect as being something that is uh, a a, uh, a function of the brain that is uh, a, a completely separate entity or disconnected from the spiritual heart. That's not our our, our framework that we've been taught uh, from an Islamic perspective. So I'd like to uh, just in this brief period of time talk about the issue of of racism and the spiritual diseases that uh, that inform it. And then we can, inshallah, go into some of the remedies because we also know that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Rashidin Wa Sallam said an authentic hadith that he said, Likulli da'in dua, that for every disease there is a cure. For every disease there is a cure. So as there are uh, cures or remedies for physical ailments, well, we have remedies or ilaj. Uh, for spiritual sicknesses, diseases of the heart. And uh, the issue of racism, uh, beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, and when we look at historically to the, the Salaf and the early generations, the Arabs and the people of old in the Hijaz and stretching out into other areas, they did not have the concept of race as we have today. Like, the, con the, the social construct of racism that we have today was not the social construct of race as existed 14 centuries ago amongst the Sahaba, uh, though we have the we have what in Islamic ter terminology in our hadith, we have the term al asabiya uh, tribalism, uh, or uh, we could say blameworthy tribalism, because all, all connection to tribe is not bad, but this ta'asab in which uh, racism, uh, we can say, or al unsuria is but a branch that comes out of al asabiya And I'm going to reference a, a friend of mine uh, who uh, is uh, trained in, from Western academia, but also uh, studied traditionally with the Mashaikh in West Africa. He's a friend of mine who teaches at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Dr. Rudolph Bilal Ware, uh, Hafidahullah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bilal Ware, a Maliki, uh, he made uh, a statement and he says it very often that racism is satanic religion. Racism is satanic religion. Now you say that might be a strong statement. Well, we will get into the proofs of that to then show the diseases that undergird racism, right? And from the perspective of Ta'asab and racism that comes out of it, we can say that the first act of racism in creation, we can look at Surah Al-Ahraf in the 12th ayah of Surah Al-Ahraf as the seventh surah of the Quran. And we know the story of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commanded the angels and those in their assembly to prostrate uh, to Adam alayhi salam, and all of them did except for Iblis. And upon interrogation, we know that Iblis said, 
خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين إبليس said I am better than him and then he spoke to Allah and said you made me a fire but you made him from the clay or from the dirt so this is uh, what we could say in creation, the first act of racism. Now, in explanation of this particular thing, uh, then we go to uh, one of the the the, uh, the primary spiritual disease that informs racism, based upon this Quranic narrative, right? And this explanation was gi given by. Sayyidina Ali Nabi Talib, Karamallahu Ta'ala Wajhu Radiallahu An. And this is narrated by uh, as a Maqshari uh, who narrates the saying of uh, Sayyidina Ali. He said regarding Iblis, Fa'adullah, Imamu Muta'asabin was Salafu Mustakbarin, Ella Dina Wada'a Asasal Asabiyah. So this is very important. So Iblis is the enemy of God. He's the enemy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Sayyidina Ali said that he is the imam of the tribalists or the racists. So hence we had to say of Dr. Ware that racism is satanic religion. This relates to the saying of Sayyidina Ali. Iblis is the imam of the tribalists or the racists and the predecessor of those who are arrogant. And he was the one who set the foundations of al asabiya of the tribalism and the racism, is Iblis, right? So then we look at the first spiritual disease that influences racism is arrogance. It is uh, Al-Kibr, racism, and uh, Takabur, that race, uh, that arrogance, so Al-Kibr, arrogance, and then Takabur, in which that arrogance, which is inside of the heart, then manifests itself outwardly into speech, into actions. And again, going back to Iblis, Iblis is the one that specifically made a declarative statement, right? He made a declarative statement that based upon uh, physical creation, that he was better than Adam. He said, I made a fire. So fire is, 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 is part of his sifa. And then uh, Adam's made from the dirt. And uh, so this is this is the, the, the root. So we look at and we go to the Quran again. And Soto Baqarah, for instance, as just to highlight this again, because Allah Azza wa Jalla specifically uses this language of arrogance as it relates to this action by Iblis, the original racist. So if we look at Soto Baqarah, of course, it's the second chapter of the Quran. It's the longest surah in the Quran, the 34th ayah of the Quran. And he, Azawajal, said, So it is Iblis uh, that Allah is speaking to. He says, Remember when we, Allah is speaking in the royal we. And Allah says, and remember, when Allah spoke to the angels and those in their assembly and commanded them to prostrate to Adam. And they did. All of them did, except Iblis. He refused. And he was arrogant. He was arrogant. He made himself bigger than what he was. And he is from those who are the rejecters of faith. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam mentioned in regards to this spiritual disease, and now we'll see the individual, we'll see how this relates to the individual, and then can extend into something that is societal. Uh, this is an important hadith that is uh, authentic, narrated by Imam Muslim Rahimahullah Ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam said, Relating to this spiritual disease, El Kibro Batul Haq is number one. El Kibro Batul Haq, Wagamtun Nas, Wagamtun Nas. So, it is arrogance. Arrogance causes one to reject the truth, number one. And then, number two, 
and then to undermine or put down or marginalize other people, right? This is what, this is two things that Kebra does. One, when the truth comes or when uh, rights, and of course, el Haq is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, in this act of disobedience uh, of Iblis, he actually rejected Allah himself right? He, he rejected the command. He was rejecting Allah himself by rejecting his command. It causes one to reject the truth and that which is right. And we know that hukuk relates to al-haq. So hukuk are rights. Like when we say hukuk and sand, this is human rights, right? So on the individual level, arrogance, this disease in the heart will cause someone to reject the truth. It will even cause someone to reject the God-given rights that Allah has extended to human beings irrespective of their lineage, irrespective of their phenotype. But we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extended this nobility to all human beings uh, in their fitra, irrespective of skin color, hair texture, other types of phenotype lineage. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it, karamna bani Adam. Allah Azza wa Jal said most certainly that he has honored all of the children of Adam. All children of Adam have been given intrinsic nobility and dignity from birth. And then we relinquish it through our, our disobedience, our lack of faith, and etc. We, we can uh, relinquish uh, some of that, and we can sink down to the lowest of the low on an individual level. But to put down someone simply because of their skin color and hair texture, uh, this is a form of arrogance that informs racism. And then to undermine other groups of people, then you seek to put them down. Put them down because they're outside of your group of people based upon things such as lineage, uh, uh, nationality and other things, phenotype. And this is the problem of, of racism and uh, arrogance, brothers and sisters in Islam. Out of all the spiritual diseases, it is the, uh, the most dangerous of all spiritual diseases. Now, running a close second behind this in which this spiritual disease has a relationship to the former is al hasid al hasid is another spiritual disease a disease of the heart that informs racism al hasid is normally translated as envy right and al hasid brothers and sisters in islam is not simply uh just for clarification purposes because some people will say uh jealousy uh, al hasid is is jealousy um, there's a difference between you seeing something that someone has or a characteristic they has and they admire it. You admire it. Okay, let's you say the individual level. Uh, I'll use myself. There's a difference between I seeing a trait in someone that's noble or good and I admire it and I want it for myself. Like I want that good thing that the other person has, right? That's one thing. I admire it and I think it has ihsan or excellence or spiritual beauty or it's something that is uh, uh, jamal and uh, I want it too. That's one thing. al hasid is not only that you see something that someone else has, it goes beyond admiration and that you want it for themselves and you want that person to lose it or to have it stripped from them. Now, this is al hasid and this is uh, another disease that can also inform racism on an individual level as well as from the collective. Now, uh, one of the great scholars uh, of, the, uh, of the Salaf, uh, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, uh, Sufyan ibn Uyayna was one of the teachers, by the way, of Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu. 
Uh, he's one of the, as well as a, uh, a teacher as the, of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahmatullah alayhi. Sufyan ibn Thawri said, Al Hasid or envy was the first thumb or was the first uh, sin of disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jal in as or we could say in the heaven. Yani, uh, meaning is the Hasid of Iblis against Adam. So this is uh, the first act of Hasid. We can see is when Iblis was envious over Adam. And this relates to the disobedience. And we know that Allah Azawajal said that and he told the angels and those in their assembly, including the, the jinn and the Iblis is from the jinn, told them that surely I am uh, going to create a, an authority or a vice jared, uh, a khalifa in the earth. And uh, Iblis, uh, seeing as being uh, a leader and being pious and being uh, amongst the angels, uh, was envious over this proclamation because he believed that he was more worthy of being the leader than this being that he saw Abu Bashar, Adam, alayhi salam, who was made from the dirt. So he also became envious over this position. Now, uh, I'll give you an example of this because you might say, well, how could envy display itself in racism? So I'll give you a historical example from the United States of America. Maybe some of you all over in the UK heard about this um, a couple of months ago when uh, President Donald Trump was planning on having a campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And something notorious happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, about 80 some years ago, close to 80 years ago. Uh, it's called the Massacre of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it relates to a, a particular area of Tulsa known as Black Wall Street. So Black Wall Street was an area in which uh, despite uh, racist laws in the South, uh, despite uh, organized efforts such as the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, uh, in the United States of America, black people, uh, through working against the odds and all of these institutional barriers, worked extremely hard and established a, a thriving business district known as Black Wall Street. And some of the white people who were in the area, their hasid, saw these black people being prosperous and thought that they should have what those black people had. So they looked at black people and, and saw these black people were living good and actually thought that the black people were living better than them. So their hasid caused them to go on a murderous rampage in which they killed black people and they burned down to the ground all of the black business district known as Black Wall Street. And this racist act, uh, we know historically, was, was driven by envy of those uh, group of white men thinking that those black people did not deserve what they had. They felt they were more worthy than it and they felt that if they couldn't have it, that they wanted it at least to be stripped and taken from them. And this is part of the reality of the spiritual disease of racism. So we went to, we're talking about issues of the Qalb, and now we will go a little beyond that and also discuss the issue of the inward issues that relate to uh, ignorance of ignorance, which is also a trait that informs racism. And we know that Sayyidina Ali Nabi Talib also said, and this is narrated in Sifat al-Safwa by Ibn al-Jawzi al-Hanbali, rahmatullahi There's a saying, where Sayyidina Ali said, nasu ma jahilu, that people are adversaries or people are uh, enemies of what they're ignorant of. And nasu ma jahilu. People are enemies, generally speaking, 
of what they are ignorant of. Sayyidina Ali said this, Karamallahu ta'ala wajahu radiallahu an. Now there are two types of ignorance that we have to look at. Because some is, some ignorance can be benign, we can say, while there's other form of ignorance that is, if, if we're using this language, benign and malignant. So the first is Jahl Basit. This is what could be translated as simple ignorance, like our scholars have written about this issue of Jahl Basit. So Jahl Basit is, you know, a person doesn't know something, or a person doesn't know about a particular group of people, but they know that they don't know. Right? They know they don't know. But this person, even though they know they don't know, they can even be influenced by uh, false things that have been said in the culture. Uh, some people call this uh, implicit bias, where there's a certain sort of uh, framework uh, that's been put out about a certain group of people, or a and also with that, a certain type of, of erasure of that people's history, or certain positive things about those people. And uh, it can cause people to have um, the wrong conclusions about an entire group of people. But the person knows that they don't have uh, a lot of knowledge about these other people, and they admit it. And this is Jahl Wasid. Jahl Murakab is something else. Jahl Murakab is translated as compounded ignorance, or it can either be translated as complex ignorance. So Jahl Murakab is when a person lacks knowledge about a particular thing, and we're talking about racism. So when a person lacks knowledge about a particular group of people, but they incorrectly think that they know, and then they speak and act with confidence in their ignorance. And this is part of the problem of the issue of racism, right? Where you have people who are, on the one hand, you have a group of people who are scared of the unknown. Uh, then you have uh, another group of people who are jahil but think they know, and they proactively try to work against or undermine a group of people or insult them based upon their jahil, based upon their ignorance. And if and a, a good example of someone who was uh, jahil murakab, of course, is we can look at Abu Jahl, who was a fir'aun of, of, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then like his comments we can read in history and his statements that he said and how he uh, put down people and uh, how they referred to uh, the the uh, the uh, the ignorant Arabs would refer to uh, Bilal and things like this. This is a prime example of we could say someone that has Jahl Murakab, right? Would be someone like Abu Jahl, right? Um, for the sake of time, I will uh, try to uh, speed this up. Although I will make one other comment that the issue of racism should not just be simply reduced to prejudice plus power. I have to say that because in the language of critical race theory, CRT, racism is reduced to the issue of prejudice plus power. Um, that doesn't jive with the Quranic paradigm in the sense that if we say that Iblis is the father of racism, Iblis never had positional power over Adam. He was never Adam's sultan. Uh, nor is shaitan our sultan. And the Quran clearly says this. And actually, shaitan himself on the day of judgment will say that I had no power over you, so don't blame me. You know, blame yourselves, right? And this is in Surah Ibrahim, uh, for instance. Uh, so um, we just, there is, there is consequences for us having these diseases of the heart and speaking or acting upon them even if we don't have positional power. If, of course, if someone has the uh, capacity to harm people or further marginalize people from society uh, because of their racism, this has greater uh, impact. But it isn't to say that we should just say that racism has, 
if, if someone doesn't have positional power, let's say you're in the UK and you're not white, uh, therefore, uh, because you're not white, then therefore uh, you can't uh, be racist or you uh, don't commit racism, uh, then this is, um, I think, a flawed way of looking at it because racism and acting upon these spiritual diseases has consequences, right? Acting, acting off of arrogance, envy, and compounded ignorance has, firstly, it has, it has metaphysical consequences besides societal consequences, right? So I have to say that before getting to the cures. Number one, the one, even if they have no positional power, if they harbor racist thoughts inside of their heart, inside of their minds, and speak upon it and or act upon it, it is sinful, right? And that even includes if someone's speech or actions targeted someone in the, in the dominant culture. It doesn't make it spiritually benign. It's still sinful, right? So it's, 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 it's the noob, right, upon us. Right. And so we should even be careful about the language that we use. And we know in Sultan Hujarat, uh, uh, Allah tells us, don't call people by uh, nicknames, I mean, nicknames that have a malicious intention or a bad intention behind it. As a matter of fact, uh, I would even advise you, and, and this is out of Wara, right? Like we have to be cautious in the sake, like, for instance, I don't know about in the UK, but in, in America, there's this new thing of, going around referring to uh, uh, all white women uh, uh, that uh, are maybe ill-informed or racist just to commonly refer to white people as as uh, white women as Karen. Oh, oh yeah, you know, Bilal's planning on marrying, oh, he's talking to Karen right now, or oh yeah, my study partner is Karen. Um, I would even advise against even using such language, uh, just to be frank with you. Um, that's that's my uh, opinion, and Allah knows best. Also, our actions and words have consequences that cannot be readily seen, right? So even if we're not in the dominant culture, right? But our actions and our words that are based in racism can have consequences in the social environment, even though we don't readily see them at the time. Right. So we as Muslims, we're supposed to be a people of healing and we're supposed to offer people a path towards healing and redemption. Right. So we we have to be careful in these times and these discussions about combating racism that we end up. Imitating, in a sense, the dispositions of the people that we are critiquing. As Omar al-Mukhtar said, uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and we know, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Omar al-Mukhtar, but he was a great uh, uh, Libyan uh, freedom fighter in the early 20th century who was resisting the racist fascism of Italians who invaded and occupied Libya, right? And the Libyans suffered a lot of racism from the Italians and atrocities. And on one particular Ghazwa, the Libyan resistance, uh, the uh, Muqawwama, uh, stood up and they actually defeated the, uh, the, the Italians during a campaign, an act of resistance, and they captured some Italian soldiers. And uh, the Libyans, uh, one of the Libyans, a, a field commanders of Omar Mukhtar, wanted to do something to the to the Italians, what the Italians have been doing to the Libyans. And, and Omar Mukhtar told him, they are not our teachers. Right? They are not our teachers. So uh, just because people in the dominant society do or say, uh, bad things and put people down simply because of phenotype, uh, we should not do uh, the same thing. And of course, we know what our prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La fadlan al-Arabin al-Ajami wa al-Ajami al-Arabi wa 
aswad al al-ahmar al ahmar al aswad illa bi taqwa right we know it's uh, authentic hadith narrated by imam ahmed ibn hanbal rahimahullah ta'ala that the arab does not have any virtue over the non arab nor does the non arab have any superiority over the arab and the black doesn't have virtue over the white nor does the white have any superior over the black illa bi taqwa right so that's where we should be operating from and that's put to the test uh, when we are dealing with people that have racism. I will uh, now go to the remedies and, and strategies of dealing with this issue uh, of racism based upon treating diseases of arrogance and envy and then also strategies of dealing with the issue of jahl uh, in particular uh, we'll talk about the the, the first uh, form of jahl, uh, inshallah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidi Muhammad wa ala Ali. So remedies of dealing with kibr, we will start with that first. You know, there's a uh, there's a poem in a uh, book. Actually, I have it here. It's a it's a it's a very good book. I would suggest getting it, especially for those of you who. Um, it hasn't been translated into English. It's been translated into French. It's called Misalik al-Janan by Sheikh Ahmed Bamba al-Maliki. Um, and it's, uh, so this version I have here, is, it's in, uh, in French and in Arabic. But um, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba wrote a poem, um, in, in a portion of Misalik al-Janan, this, this epic poem that he wrote. And he talks about spiritual diseases and cures in one section. And something about his background, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba dealt with this issue from two levels. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was uh, captured by the French when the French invaded and, uh, and they colonized uh, West Africa. And he was from this Sen Senegalese Gambia uh, region. The French colonized that uh, era, area, and Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was sent in exile. He was sent in exile to Gabon and also to Mauritania. So he wrote a poem, and he talked about dealing with spiritual diseases. And he starts off with discussing the issue of kibber. And he he also wrote in this poem relating to the racism that he faced, and he faced racism from the French. And then he also faced racism uh, from Arabs, uh, from his own brethren as well uh, in, in Mauritania, right? So he wrote in his poem, and I'm summarizing it, he told us and he said to his students to contemplate our own creation, right? So he said, we were all born from smelly nutfa. Nutfa means sperm. We all were born from smelly sperm. Then we walked this earth as a sack of feces, meaning we all have feces in ourselves that we let out. And then we all return, and then we return to the earth as a rotten corpse. Know that all of you are children of Adam, and Adam was created from the Torab from the from the, the the dirt. And that of course relates to the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam when he mentioned this in the farewell sermon that that all of us uh, all of us have one father, Adam, and Adam was created from the dirt. Now this is very interesting in this even from a fifty perspective this poem. But he said we should contemplate our creation. When the Jasa is released, excuse me, when when Nutfah is released from a man or gets uh, upon uh, someone, all right, uh, or, or a thing, is considered ritually impure, najasa. So there has to be gusl that's to be made and or that's, that, that, that thing that it got on has to be washed or it's ritually impure. And then we know that feces, when it's excreted, is also ritually impure. I mean, all of our stuff stinks, right? So there has to be uh, wudu uh, that's made uh, after that. And then he said, and we return to the earth as a smelly corpse. Right? Uh, so uh, this is uh, very interesting, even when he 
goes into the issue of even describing this, there are even fiqi implications. So number one, this is, and of course we know we can't look at any superiority of one skeleton over or another with the untrained eye. So we should reflect on our creation and our creator, Al Khalaq subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, created us. And because we are a creation, we, we all have a beginning and we all have an end. We all have the same beginning and we all will have the same end. Allahu Akbar. And Allah is greater than all of us. He's greater than his creation. So we should contemplate our creation. And then by contemplating our creation, we can then see uh, the destiny that the creator has set for all of us. And Allah is the greatest. Allah is greater than all of us. He's Akbar. So inshallah, this will help us deal with our kibar. Allahu Akbar. Number two, inverse the saying of Iblis. Now we're talking about dealing with our own hearts, right? Inverse the saying of Iblis. So Iblis said, I am better than him, right? When we feel this coming up inside of ourselves, we should say to ourselves, perhaps such and such is better than me, right? Huwa khairun minni. Or he a khairun right? He or she is better than them. Perhaps Allah who Azawajal has given that person something they haven't given me. Perhaps there's something unique about that person's culture, and there's something uh, uh, beautiful in that person's culture that is not my culture that I could learn from. So we have to in invert the saying of Iblis if we feel this ethnic or racial arrogance coming up in our hearts. Right. And as Dr. Sherman Abdul Hakim Jackson said, Hafidahullah, uh, he teaches at U University of Southern California. He said, hard work is hard work. Like, this is the hardest work to catch ourselves when we start having these inclinations and these feelings. Another issue is to take a spiritual mentor. And I would even go further to say to take a spiritual mentor from the particular from a particular group outside of yourselves, if able to in the West. You know, um, and of course we know that Musa alayhi salam had a spiritual guide or spiritual mentor, as mentioned in Sotul Kaf, which is mustahab for us to read uh, on Laylatul Jum'ah or Yomul Jum'ah. We know him as Al Khadr alayhi salam. Literally means the green one. Actually, for, for those of you who don't know, an old Arab writing, actually, when someone is described as having alone or having green skin, this means someone who's black. By the way, if you ever read any old Arabic uh, poems or uh, read uh, things from early uh, Islamic uh, sources and you come across someone having green skin or someone being described as green, it means that they're black. Um, so for instance, I'll give you an example. Sheikh Omar Farooq uh, uh, Abdullah, Hafidahullah, Dr. Omar. Uh, who's here in the States. He spends half his time here in the States and half his time in West Africa and Gambia. He's a white American. He's a white American convert to Islam. Sheikh Omar was very keen and aware about the racial makeup in, a, in the United States of America, right? And the issue of how white people, especially many white people in America who come from educated middle class, upper middle class backgrounds, have uh, the the leaning towards giving themselves cultural superiority in America. So Sheikh Omar got a black spiritual mentor. Okay, his spiritual mentor died. Now his spiritual mentor is Sheikh uh, Muhammad uh, Hydra Al Jilani, uh, who's in the Gambia, who's actually around my age. So not only did he get a spiritual mentor to help him check his nafs, uh, who is African, who's black, but also his spiritual mentor is young enough to be his son. And then the other suggestion is, is to do khidma or to do service for others, but not in a paternalistic type of way to actually go to people and to try to serve them, right? To do a service for them, to humble oneself, because li, uh, li kulli da in dua, for every disease is a cure, 
part of how we deal with spiritual diseases is that we invert and we do the opposite of that, right? We do the opposite of the disease. That's how we treat the disease. So if you feel hum, if you feel arrogant that people are beneath you, then you humble yourselves and put yourself at service to those other people. And this helps us in, in with this issue of the nefs or the ego that is uh, that can sometimes our 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 nefs is like our inward fir'aun, and based upon arrogance, Emil fir'aun. Uh, was driven from arrogance. I will, sorry for running a little uh, over, I was playing for q and I will just deal with the issue of, I'll try to wrap this up without giving uh, the examples uh, for the next two uh, specifics um, and just go right into it. In regard to envy, number one, contemplate that Allah is the dispenser of all blessings and what someone has that we may envy or, or look at that we may envy of a particular other group is Allah that gave it to, to that person or that group and he dispenses blessings the way that he pleases. We should also remember number two, the favors that Allah has bestowed upon us, right? And desist in qiyas fasid, right? In making these false comparisons, we should not compare ourselves to other groups in, in such ways. This is the, the false pias of Iblis. And this is, by the way, in a lecture you can read or look at this is in Hilya to Awliya, where uh, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq uh, uh, was giving a, a, a session with Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, in regards to this, because Iblis was the first of those who was involved in this blameworthy comparison of looking at Adam and looking at himself, right? And we discussed this issue with envy already. And those who we feel envious for, we should pray for them that Allah blesses them and increases them instead of, again, doing the opposite of thinking that those people aren't worthy of certain things. We should pray that Allah guides people and grants them khair. Now, strategies of dealing with ignorance, I'll just wrap this up. There is internal and external, and we should be open to learning from others outside of our group, formally and informally, right? So learning about other people's histories, learning about their cultures, that's formal. And informal is how we get a ma'rifah in a sense of actually having living, breathing experiences of going to people's neighborhoods going to their families, sitting with them, breaking bread with them, and and acquainting ourselves with them through those means. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Hujurat, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِي تَعَرَفُوا He may have different ethnic groups and different clans or tribes that we may get to know one another, right? Not that we segregate from each other, not that we remain ignorant, Right. And this has to be purposeful and consistent. Right. With others whom we are ignorant of. Right. It has to be purposeful and consistent. It doesn't mean just uh, going to one workshop uh, about black people in Islam. For as I use this as an example. Uh, external. When we're dealing with people outside of ourselves that are that are racist. Uh, and it's based upon, uh, and, it, and it could be based upon Jahl Basit in particular, that we shouldn't continue to engage and seek to educate people uh, with principled substance. At the same time, we should be moderate in our tone and presentation, right? We should be moderate in our tone and our presentation. As the Prophet was, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he corrected Abu Dhar an, when he told him that you are a person that has jahiliya in you. You have some remnants of jahiliya in you. Right? He didn't say anta ya Abu Dhar anta jahil. He didn't call my name and said that he was an ignoramus. He said you you have a little 
of, of ignorance in you still, right? But he didn't uh, he didn't degrade Abu ja uh, Abu Dhar or call him names and things such as this. Um, so we have to be uh, wise in how we correct people as well on individual levels of of of, uh, of racism, and when people are incessantly uh, racist with us and are displaying compound ignorance and to the point that they become belligerent or hostile, then that's when we um, disengage those individual persons at that particular time. As we are told in Surah Al-Ahraf, the 199th ayah, and I will conclude, well, Allah Azza wa Jal gives us three commands, Khudul uh, Af, so he gives three commands in this ayah, right? So again, we take to pardoning. We should be generous in, 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 in al-af. Then we enjoy what is good, but we do this with leniency and with mildness. And then the third part is, then then we disengage. We disengage from ignoramuses, right? When people have jahl muraqab and they continue to buckle down to the point where the atmosphere uh, becomes completely belligerent in which there is either, which could lead to physical violence or rhetorical, uh, uh, rhetorical violence, then we uh, disengage uh, from the people of jahl muraqab uh, at that particular point. Uh, with that, I will conclude, brothers and sisters, in Islam and go to any uh, questions uh, that you may have over what I have uh, gone over. Also, to let you know, there is, um, that was an old bio of mine that was read. Um, I will, I co-wrote uh, two books uh, on centering black narrative. If you can look at that, uh, look it up there on Amazon. And I wrote a book called Towards Sacred Activism uh, that can be found. Um, uh, I think there's one bookstore in London that uh, that sells it, and I think it's the Islamic Human Rights uh, Commission their bookstore. Um, so you can get that book, and that perhaps will help you in looking at issues of racism or anti-racism from an Islamic perspective. Then I have a book that's be that's coming out on November 1st in the month, inshallah. Uh, that's being published through a through a uh, a publisher from the UK, and it's called uh, it's entitled Blackness in Islam. So those are some resources that could also help uh, if you're interested in dealing with this uh, this topic that uh, I've discussed today. Jazakallah khair. Um, yeah. For um, amazing talk and for taking the time out. Alhamdulillah. Um, We've got some questions from the Mentimeter link. So I think I'll just start by reading out a few of those questions. Um, the first question, we actually had a few of these actually um, to do with BLM, Black Lives Matter. So one of the questions is, um, you outlined the Islamic approach for approaching racism. Um, so should Muslims um, not support the BLM movement and only stick to the Islamic framework or should they combine a bit of both? Or what should be our perspective on 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 the BLM movement essentially? Okay, um, we should be taking the Islamic framework into everything we do, right? We never check that in, whether we deal with other people and coalitions or not. Um, how they operate is independent over how our epistemology should be about how we judge truth, how we should organize. And what language we should use is independent of what everyone else does. So we should be very clear on that. In regards to uh, Black Lives Matter and the issue of anti-Blackness and challenging that has preceded uh, this movement called Black Lives Matter, um, I, I want to divide this into three parts. And I wrote an article about this if you want to go to... Um, El Medina Institute, which I uh, do writing for them, as well as um, uh, my book, Towards Secret Activism, is printed through El Medina Institute, by the way. You'll see that I divide this particular issue into three different parts. 
There's Black Lives Matter, the slogan or the mantra. There's the Black Lives Matter protests. Then there's the actual Black Lives Matter organization. Those are different things. So we have to be careful about conflating those things. Black Lives Matter as a mantra, a slogan, had nothing to do with police brutality in its origins. Black Lives Matter as a slogan started when Trayvon Martin, an African-American teenager who's an honor roll student, went to a store to buy an Arizona iced tea and some Skittles, and he was killed by a, a, a vigilante named George Zimmerman, who's, by the way, who's half Latino, so he's a so-called person of color who killed him. That's when the slogan Black Lives Matter started as a Twitter hashtag, right? Then you have the Black Lives Matter protests in which people resurrected that mantra during the killing of another African-American teenager who just graduated high school in Ferguson, Missouri, by the name of Mike Brown. And I was uh, a part of, of, of some of that organizing through something called Muslims for Ferguson. So you can look that up online. And there were Muslims that were on the streets protesting in Ferguson. Then you have, after that, start something called the Black Lives Matter organization, which is a nonprofit organization that is primarily, uh, let me say, it, it was not started by funding from black people. It was, it was funded by outside foundation money, not from the black grassroots and in their intersectional uh inter in their intersectional um uh agenda in which uh three of the co-founders happen to be from the lgbtq community and that's not by accident by the way um they brought in some other things uh including uh they had on their website i believe they just recently changed it but the destruction of the nuclear family and also the dismantling of what they call heteronormativity, right? So obviously, as Muslims, we believe that gender is a divine construct. Allah created the dhakr and he created the untha, right? And there are certain things uh, sexually that, and identity-wise that that movement uh, propagates that is clearly haram. This is like from al mah al din but durura that these, are, these aren't up for discussion theologically. Right, I have to be clear about that. Um, so that's different. So um, do we join a, a, a march against police brutality in which people call it Black Lives Matter uh, to show our indignation? Um, that depends, right? It depends on each circumstance. Uh, so... Um, is the Black Lives Matter movement actually organizing it or just people went out into the streets and then it's considered a Black Lives Matter, right? Uh, then again, what is the protest calling for or towards, right? Like what are the solutions? So uh, maybe we get involved in the protests, maybe we don't. But I would say unequivocally that we should not be donating uh, money to the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, organization. And I would also say this too, that as Muslims, uh, and, and this is a, and there's a, and by the way, in the United States of America, where Black Lives Matter movement started, there is a robust discussion within the Black American community about this particular issue. Like everyone is, is not supportive of the Black Lives Matter organization. There are, there's other forms of organizing with inside the black community outside of Black Lives Matter framework. And there always has been, right? So um, there's a difference between supporting black life and supporting Black Lives Matter. So uh, we just have to be uh, clear upon that. And But we never check in our dean at the door and organizing with anyone. And uh, if the cause is righteous, and uh, and we don't have to endorse anything that is un-Islamic in the process. Then uh, we have the example of hof, of helpful fudul uh, that, that the Prophet mentioned, alayhi salam, where uh, we can enter into coalitions with people uh, who even we disagree with some of their beliefs or lifestyles, but we don't champion or help propagate that or their language, right? Uh, so we had we have to be clear in our own language. And have our own 
uh, epistemology instead of copying everyone else. And that's part of the problem. Uh, I see a lot of organizing, and this is why I wrote the book Towards Sacred Activism, uh, to, to address this, uh, this epistemological issue. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you very much for answering that question. There's also another question on um, any resources or, or books. So I, what I'll do is I'll, in, in the comment section, inshallah, I'll put a link to Towards Sacred Activism. Um, and if anyone's wondering about any books or resources, I think they can go, go to that link. Yeah, I, um, I would suggest Towards, resources. so there's, there's a couple of things. There's one, the issue of, um, Blackness in particular, in particular, and dealing with the issue of racism within the Muslim community. And then there's also the other issue of organizing and dealing with people who are who uh, who are outside of our community. So for the latter, towards sacred activism is, I would think, would be a useful tool. In regards to the, uh, the former, uh, I cannot point to one particular book that deals with the issue of, of Tezkia based upon the issue of spiritual diseases that inform racism. However, there are many books on Tezkia and you can study these with, with teachers. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's several, whichever one that you lean towards, whether it's uh, Kitab al-Gunya by uh, Abdul Qadir Jilani al Hambali or Ibn al Jawzi has written about this, or Ibn Qayyim, uh, or you know, who, who are uh, the, the, the Ihya of Imam Ghazali. Uh, there's many different books and, and that you could uh, take a class with with teachers uh, to uh, deal with Tahdib uh, Nufus or the refinement of the inward self. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question. Um, which is asking how we should deal with um, racism within our own families, um, and especially by those older to us um, in, in position. Yeah, that's the most, that's a very difficult issue to deal with. And I would say that one, and as a lot, as what Joe tells us, that we lower the wing of humility, especially with our parents and our elders. And <clears throat> Many of our elders, if we're immigrants, many of our elders came from countries that were more homogenous, where people basically looked like them, and there was a sense of uh, a, a, a super culture in which they were a part of. And then they come to um, Britain or America or Canada, and they're dealing with this not only multi-ethnic um, environment, but they're dealing with Muslims from all over outside of their culture. And sometimes we carry uh, stereotypes with us in baggage and not knowing these other people. And this especially, I've seen this the most in the issue of marriage where a brother or a sister tries to marry from someone outside of their ethnic group and uh, that can become a huge issue. So we have to learn how to pick our battles. So we continue to talk with people in our families, it's probably a little easier and talking with this issue with our, our peers when it comes to our elders in our family, to talk with them, to lower the wing of humility and to try to present to them um, uh, other information. And in many cases from a strategy, it may be even better to point them to someone who is a peer from their generation uh, to speak with them about these issues or getting their opinion instead of like the the child uh, you know being the primary person of addressing this with their parents their grandparents that can be a little more difficult but the sahaba dealt with this issue by the way even on the issue of ethnocentricity and um uh and i wrote about this issue or we wrote about this issue in centering black narrative for instance there were some Sahaba who had problems getting married uh, because uh, the parents of the ladies didn't want them to marry some from another ethnic group. I mean, we look at Samal Farsi dealt with this issue. Bilal Al-Habashi dealt with this issue. Julay Bib dealt with this issue. 
uh, um, uh, uh, Saad al-Aswad dealt with this situation. So we have a number of prominent Sahaba that 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 had this uh, issue. And the Prophet himself, alayhi salam, had to intervene in some of these issues, right, himself, right? And uh, even when he intervened and said something in a couple of situations, even the parents still didn't even want to listen to the Prophet. And, and these are and these are from the Ansar, for God's sake. This is the best generation. And even they didn't want to hear it. So that's just to let you know that um, we have to lower the wing of humility, of course, to make it to awe. And, and, and sometimes we just have to um, we have to pick our battles on like what we're going to talk about. So I don't have this totally figured out is my is, is why I want to put an exclamation on. There is no one piece of advice that I can give that's going to like fit all because it's this is a very uh, complex and sensitive issue, and especially when it comes to the issue of marriage, especially that issue. That's where it's the most sensitive. Okay, thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense as well. Um, what the, One last question, um, because I'm conscious of time as well. Um, what would you, so someone's asked this question, what would you advise for trying to curb colloquial use of language and um, that is uh, in quotes prejudiced against uh, white people as an example and um, for example the, the example that you mentioned was Karen is often justified um, as not being racist because it's there's no positional power in, in, in that sense um, so how would you sort of deal with the colloquial language which is used um, on a day-to-day -day basis like that I'll give I'll give two hadith and conclude the first of that is we know this uh, hadith of of leave that which makes you doubt for that which does not make you doubt. So if there is a, 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 a questionable term that's being used to generalize an entire group of people, then I would suggest that if that we leave it. There's doubt in it, we should leave it. Even if on the face, it seems to be, we might think it's benign. Like I, like I'm, like I mentioned this issue again with Sayyidina Bilal, because we could even say something that's true, that has that has um, a malicious intention or has the intention of mocking people, even though it's a truthful statement. So I'll give you an example. When it's narrated that Bilal was called Yabna Sauda, oh, you son of a black woman. That was a truthful statement because Bilal's mother was a black woman. But in the, the, the intention behind saying it was to basically find fault with blackness. So that's that's not acceptable, right? So that's one thing. Leave that what makes you doubt, but that what doesn't make you doubt. And then, of course, the golden rule. And narrated by Imam Nasai, rahimahullah ta'ala. And I, I narrate that version of the hadith, or I mentioned that narration in particular. None of you believes until he loves for his brother or sister, meaning in humanity. The Hadith scholars said this doesn't mean just for the Muslim, for humankind. None of you believes until you love for your brother or sister in humanity what you love from yourself, min al khair, meaning that which is from goodness or excellence, right? So if you don't want people talking about you or talking about people in your group using these like colloquial terms that can be used to like put someone down or to marginal or, or, or to mock someone, then you don't do that to other people, including if they're in the dominant culture. You know, you don't do it in the dominant culture. And this goes for ageism too, right? Like for instance, like I got, um, subhanAllah, I'm in my forties. So I, I'm, a, I, I get, I'm an uncle now, right? I guess. But um, I had a teenager uh, a couple of weeks ago, refer to me online and call me boomer. Right. So like uh, which initially starts on from the baby boomer generation, but boomer. But like we shouldn't even be going around calling people boomer like that's that that was that's 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 wrong what she did. And, and, and of course, um, like any name calling, that's an ad hominem to try to to try to refute someone's point uh, like ad hominems of calling people names doesn't take away truthful statements. 
Like that's no way that we should be involved in trying to make our point if we disagree with someone is not calling them Karen or Boomer or anything else. Okay. Jazakallah khair um, for those answers. Um, what I'll do now is I'll just post a little comment and everyone can check out, inshallah, um, the article and the books that um, Imam Dawood Wali mentioned. Um, so that's just in the Facebook chat. <clears throat> I hope that came up. Okay, yeah. Okay, someone's kindly put that together into a, into a comment. Um, and so <coughs> guys could fill in a, um, a link today for, for the feedback form. So again, that's something which I'll post in the Facebook chat. Um, it just helps us as an Islamic society um, try our best to put on better um, events every time um, and to take from your feedback. Um, and once again, um, that's in the chat. But thank you very much, um, Imam Dawood Wali, for, for joining us today to speak about this issue. Um, I've been quite enlightened on, on the issue, alhamdulillah, um, after this, this talk um, is very beneficial. Um, and I'm sure everyone else in the, um, who's been watching, following along, has found it equally beneficial, inshallah. Um, with that being said, um, do you have any final um, comments um, or any statements? No, no, no further comments or statements. I think we'll end it there, inshallah, um, because my room is coming up soon. But thank you very much once again. Alhamdulillah. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.